This is Chapter Twelve of Tom Sawyer Abroad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Tom Sawyer Abroad, Chapter Twelve, Jim Standing Siege. The next few meals was pretty sandy, but that don't make no difference when you're hungry. When you ain't, it ain't no satisfaction to eat anyway, and so a little grit in the meat ain't no particular drawback as far as I can see. Then we struck the east end of the desert at last, sailing on a northeast course. Away off on the edge of the sand, in a soft pinky light, we see three little sharp roofs like tents, and Tom says, "'It's the pyramids of Egypt.' It made my heart fairly jump. You see, I had seen a many and a many a picture of them, and heard tell about them a hundred times, and yet to come on them all of a sudden that way and find they was real, instead of imaginations, most knocked the breath out of me with surprise. It's a curious thing that the more you hear about a grand and big and bully thing or person, the more it kind of dreamies out, as you may say, and gets to be a big, dim, wavery figure made out of moonshine and nothing solid to it. It's just so with George Washington, and the same with them pyramids. And moreover, besides, the thing they always said about them seemed to me to be stretchers. There was a feller come to the Sunday school once and had a picture of them, and made a speech, and said the biggest pyramid covered thirteen acres and was most five hundred foot high, just a steep mountain all built out of hunks of stone as big as a bureau, and laid up in perfectly regular layers like stair-steps. Thirteen acres, you see, for just one building. It's a farm. If it hadn't been in Sunday school, I would have judged it was a lie, and outside I was certain of it, and he said there was a hole in the pyramid, and you could go in there with candles, and go ever so far up a long slanting tunnel, and come to a large room in the stomach of that stone mountain, and there you would find a big stone chest with a king in it, four thousand years old. I said to myself then, if that ain't a lie, I will eat that king if they will fetch him, for even Methuselah weren't that old, and nobody claims it. As we come a little nearer, we see the yaller sand come to an end in a long straight edge like a blanket, and on to it was joined, edge to edge, a wide country of bright green, with a snaky stripe crooking through it, and Tom said it was the Nile. It made my heart jump again, for the Nile was another thing that wasn't real to me. Now I can tell you one thing, which is dead certain. If you will fool along over three thousand miles of yaller sand, all glimmering with heat so it makes your eyes water to look at it, and you've been a considerable part of a week doing it, the green country will look so like home and heaven to you that it will make your eyes water again. It was just so with me, and the same with Jim. And when Jim got so he could believe it was the land of Egypt he was looking at, he wouldn't enter it standing up, but got down on his knees and took off his hat, because he said it wasn't fitting for a humble poor nigger to come any other way where such men had been as Moses and Joseph and Pharaoh and the other prophets. He was a Presbyterian, and had a most deep respect for Moses, which was a Presbyterian, too, he said. He was all stirred up, and says, "'It's the land of Egypt, the land of Egypt, and I's loud to look at it with my own eyes, and as the river that was turned to blood, and I's looking at the very same ground where the plagues was, and the lice, and the frogs, and the locusts, and the hail, and where they marked the doorposts, and the angel of the Lord come by in the darkness of the night, and slew the firstborn in all the land of Egypt. Old Jim ain't worthy to see this day. And then he just broke down and cried, he was so thankful. So between him and Tom there was talk enough, Jim being excited because the land was so full of history, Joseph and his brethren, Moses and the bulrushes, Jacob coming down into Egypt to buy corn, the silver cup and the sack, and all them interesting things and Tom just as excited, too, because the land was so full of history that was in his line, about New Redden and Bed Redden, and such like monstrous giants that made Jim's wool rise, and a raft of other Arabian Nights folks, which the half of them never done the things they let on they done, I don't believe. Then we struck a disappointment, for one of them early morning fogs started up, 
and it weren't no use to sail over the top of it, because we would go by Egypt, sure, so we judged it was best to set her by compass straight for the place where the pyramids was getting blurred and blotted out, and then drop low and skin along pretty close to the ground and keep a sharp lookout. Tom took the helm. I stood by to let go the anchor, and Jim he straddled the bow to dig through the fog with his eyes and watch out for danger ahead. We went along a steady gait, but not very fast, and the fog got solider and solider, so solid that Jim looked dim and ragged and smoky through it. It was awful still, and we talked low and was anxious. Now and then Jim would say, Heist her a pint, Mars Tom, heist her, and up she would skip a foot or two and we would slide right over a flat-roofed mud cabin with people that had been asleep on it just beginning to turn out and gap and stretch and once when a feller was clear up on his hind legs so he could gap and stretch better we took him a blip in the back and knocked him off by and by after about an hour and everything dead still and we a straining our ears for sounds and holding our breath the fog thinned a little, very sudden, and Jim sung out in an awful scare, Oh, for the land's sake, this set her back, Mars Tom, is the biggest giant out in the Arabian Nights a-coming for us. And he went over backwards in the boat. Tom slammed on the back action, and as we slowed to a standstill, a man's face as big as our house at home looked in over the gunnel, same as a house looks out of its windows. And I laid down and died. I must have been clear dead and gone for as much as a minute or more. Then I come to, and Tom had hitched a boat-hook onto the lower lip of the giant, and was holding the balloon steady with it, whilst he canted his head back and got a good long look up at that awful face. Jim was on his knees with his hands clasped, gazing up at the thing in a begging way and working his lips, but not getting anything out. I took only just a glimpse, and was fading out again, but Tom says, he ain't alive, you fools. It's the Sphinx. I never see Tom look so little and like a fly, but that was because the giant's head was so big and awful. Awful, yes, so it was, but not dreadful any more, because you could see it was a noble face, and kind of sad, and not thinking about you, but about other things and larger. It was stone, reddish stone, and its nose and ears battered, and that give it an abused look and you felt sorry for it for that. We stood off a piece and sailed around it and over it, and it was just grand. It was a man's head, or maybe a woman's, on a tiger's body a hundred and twenty-five foot long, and there was a dear little temple between its front paws. All but the head used to be under the sand for hundreds of years, maybe thousands, but they had just lately dug the sand away and found that little temple. It took a power of sand to bury that critter, most of as much as it would to bury a steamboat, I reckon. We landed Jim on top of the head, with an American flag to protect him, it being a foreign land. Then we sailed off to this and that and t'other distance, to get what Tom called effects and perspectives and proportions, and Jim he done the best he could, striking all the different kinds of attitudes and positions he could study up but standing on his head and working his legs the way a frog does was the best. The further we got away, the littler Jim got, and the grander the Sphinx got, till at last it was only a clothespin on a dome, as you might say. That's the way perspective brings out the correct proportions, Tom said. He said Julius Caesar's niggers didn't know how big he was. They was too close to him. Then we sailed off further and further, till we couldn't see Jim at all any more, and then that great figure was at its noblest a gazing out over the Nile Valley so still and solemn and lonesome, and all the little shabby huts and things that was scattered about it clean disappeared and gone, and nothing around it now but a soft, wide spread of yaller velvet, which was the sand. That was the right place to stop, and we done it. We set there a-looking and a-thinking for a half an hour, nobody a-saying anything, for it made us feel quiet and kind of solemn to remember it had been looking over that valley just that same way and thinking its awful thoughts all to itself for thousands of years, and nobody can't find out what they are to this day. At last I took up the glass and see some little black things a-capering around on that velvet carpet, and some more a-climbing up the critter's back, and then I see two or three wee puffs of white smoke and told Tom to look. He done it and says, "'They're bugs. No.' Hold on, 
they why i believe they're men yes it's men men and horses both they're hauling a long ladder up onto the sphinx's back now ain't that odd and now they're trying to lean it up a there's some more puffs of smoke it's guns huck they're after jim we clapped on the power and went for them a biling we was there in no time and come a whizzing down amongst them and they broke and scattered every which way and some that was climbing the ladder after jim let go all holts and fell we soared up and found him laying on top of the head panting and most tuckered out partly from howling for help and partly from scare he had been standing a siege a long time a week he said but it weren't so it only just seemed so to him because they was crowding him so they had shot at him and rained the bullets all around him but he warn't hit and when they found he wouldn't stand up and the bullets couldn't get at him when he was laying down they went for the ladder and then he knowed it was all up with him if we didn't come pretty quick tom was very indignant and asked him why he didn't show the flag and command them to git in the name of the united states jim said he done it but they never paid no attention tom said he would have this thing looked into at washington and says you'll see that they'll have to apologize for insulting the flag and pay an indemnity too on top of it even if they git off that easy jim says what's an indemnity mars tom it's cash that's what it is who gits it mars tom why we do and who gits the apology the united states or we can take whichever we please we can take the apology if we want to and let the government take the money how much money will it be mars tom well in an aggravated case like this one it will be at least three dollars apiece and i don't know but more well then we'll take the money mars tom blame de apology ain't that your notion too and ain't it your own huck we talked it over a little and allowed that that was as good a way as any so we agreed to take the money it was a new business to me and i asked tom if countries always apologized when they had done wrong and he says yes the little ones does we was sailing around examining the pyramids you know and now we soared up and roosted on the flat top of the biggest one and found it was just like what the man said in the sunday school it was like four pairs of stairs that starts broad at the bottom and slants up and comes together in a point at the top only these stair steps couldn't be clumb the way you climb other stairs no for each step was as high as your chin and you have to be boosted up from behind the two other pyramids weren't far away and the people moving about on the sand between looked like bugs crawling we was so high above them tom he couldn't hold himself he was so worked up with gladness and astonishment to be in such a celebrated place and he just dripped history from every pore seemed to me he said he couldn't scarcely believe he was standing on the very identical spot the prince flew from on the bronze horse it was in the arabian nights times he said somebody give the prince a bronze horse with a peg in its shoulder and he could get on him and fly through the air like a bird and go all over the world and steer it by turning the peg and fly high or low and land wherever he wanted to when he got done telling it there was one of them uncomfortable silences that comes you know when a person has been telling a whopper and you feel sorry for him and wish you could think of some way to change the subject and let him down easy but get stuck and don't see no way and before you can pull your mind together and do something that silence has got in and spread itself and done the business i was embarrassed jim he was embarrassed and neither of us couldn't say a word well tom he glowered at me a minute and says come out with it what do you think i says tom sawyer you don't believe that yourself what's the reason i don't what's to hinder me there's one thing to hinder you it couldn't happen that's all what's the reason it couldn't happen you tell me the reason it could happen this balloon is a good enough reason it could happen i should reckon why is it why is it i never saw such an idiot ain't this balloon and the bronze horse the same thing under different names no they're not one is a balloon and the other's a horse it's very different next you'll be saying a house and a cow is the same thing by jackson huck's got him again they ain't no wiggling out of that shut your head jim you don't know what you're talking about and huck don't look here huck i'll make it plain to you so you can understand you see 
it ain't the mere form that's got anything to do with their being similar or unsimilar it's the principle involved and the principle is the same in both don't you see now i turned it over in my mind and says tom it ain't no use principles is all very well but they don't get around that one big fact that the thing that a balloon can do ain't no sort of proof of what a horse can do shucks huck you don't get the idea at all now look here a minute it's perfectly plain don't we fly through the air yes very well don't we fly high or fly low just as we please yes don't we steer whichever way we want to yes and don't we land when and where we please yes how do we move the balloon and steer it by touching the buttons now i reckon the thing is clear to you at last in the other case the moving and steering was done by turning a peg we touch a button the prince turned a peg there ain't an atom of difference you see i knowed i could get it through your head if i stuck to it long enough he felt so happy he begun to whistle but me and jim was silent so he broke off surprised and says looky here huck finn don't you see it yet i says tom sawyer i want to ask you some questions go ahead he says and i see jim chirk up to listen as i understand it the whole thing is in the buttons and the peg the rest ain't of no consequence a button is one shape a peg is another shape but that ain't any matter no that ain't any matter as long as they both got the same power all right then what is the power that's in a candle and in a match it's the fire it's the same in both then yes just the same in both all right suppose i set fire to a carpenter shop with a match what will happen to that carpenter shop she'll burn up and suppose i set fire to this pyramid with a candle will she burn up of course she won't all right now the fire's the same both times why does the shop burn and the pyramid don't because the pyramid can't burn aha and a horse can't fly my land if huck ain't got him again huck's landed him high and dry this time i tell you it's the smartest trap i ever see a body walk into and if i but jim was so full of laugh he got so strangled and couldn't go on and tom was that mad to see how neat i had floored him and turned his own argument agin him and knocked him all to rags and flinders with it that all he could manage to say was that whenever he heard me and jim try to argue it made him ashamed of the human race i never said nothing i was feeling pretty well satisfied when i have got the best of a person that way it ain't my way to go around crowing about it the way some people does for i consider that if i was in his place i wouldn't wish him to crow over me it's better to be generous that's what i think end of chapter 12